Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 221 of our Pharmacotherapy MCQ series which majors in infectious diseases. And the first question reads, P.O.K., a 26-year-old man is newly diagnosed with HIV-1 infection. He had recently arrived from Lithuania where he had lived since birth. So my question to you is, how is he most likely to have acquired HIV infection? Is it a. heterosexual exposure in a long-term relationship? Or b. heterosexual exposure with a paid sex worker? or c injection drug use or d msm exposure or is it e blood transfusion following a road traffic accident i will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options And the correct answer is, C. Injection drug use. I will explain why. Although heterosexual transmission is the predominant mode of transmission in Europe and Central Asia region as a whole, transmission through injecting drug use remains significantly high in the east of the region. At the national level, injection drug use was reported as the predominant mode of transmission in Greece, Lithuania and Romania. In these three countries, transmission among PWID accounted for more than 30% of reported HIV cases. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, the magnitude of the HIV global pandemic can be assessed through HIV surveillance. Second-generation surveillance measures produce data that will inform programs and progress for reducing the spread of HIV. Third-generation surveillance systems address shortcomings of the second-generation surveillance systems. So my question to you is, which aspect of surveillance has been introduced as part of the third generation of HIV surveillance? Is it a. Behavioral surveillance from the period of infection to death? Or b. HIV incidence surveillance? Or c. Measuring quality of care for persons living with HIV? Or d. Morbidity surveillance from the period of infection to death? Or is it e. Mortality surveillance at the point of death? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, C. Measuring quality of care for persons living with HIV. I will clarify why. Measuring coverage and quality of care for persons living with HIV are both aspects that add to the points covered within second-generation HIV surveillance system. Options A, B, D and E are all components of second-generation surveillance. Please proceed to the next question.
and the next question reads Pujo, a 33-year-old woman is referred to the eye clinic from a local optician complaining of progressive worsening of vision in her right eye. Pujo describes blurred vision and floaters. Pujo has not noticed any changes in her left eye. QJO's past medical history includes recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis and shingles of L2 dermatum. QJO also has recurrent episodes of unexplained diarrhea. On examination, see photograph below. Her results are as follows. HIV AGAB positive. Toxoplasma IG, G positive. CMBIG, G positive. Fasting glucose 12.2 millimoles per liter. The normal range is 3.0 to 6.0 millimoles per liter. HIV viral load 225,542 copies per milliliter and CD 424 per microliter. Pause the video and carefully scrutinize the photo before answering the question in the next slide. So my question to you is, what treatment should be started immediately in QJO's clinical scenario? Is it A. intravitreal gancyclovir? Or B. metformin? Or C. oral valgancyclovir? Or D. sulfadiazine plus pyrimethamine plus pyridoxine? Or is it E. tenofovir plus m tricetabine plus efavirins? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is C. oral valgancyclovir. I will justify why. Her presentation is consistent with CMV retinitis, given the low CD4 count, clinical presentation and appearances of the retina. The treatment of choice is oral valgancyclovir at 900 mg twice daily for three weeks in the first instance. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, TMC, a 27-year-old MSM presented to the emergency department with an eight-week history of progressive gait disturbance, visual disturbance and altered mental status. TMC had not ever attended for sexual health screening despite regular unprotected anal intercourse with a number of different partners. TMC was mildly confused, oriented to place but not time and had word-finding difficulties. TMC described walking into door frames and difficulty doing up his trouser buttons. Investigations were done and the results were as follows. HIV-1 AGAB positive. His X-ray of chest showed normal lung fields. An MRI of his head is shown in the image in the next slide. Pause the video and carefully scrutinize this photo which is an MRI of TMC's head before answering the next question. So my question to you is, what is the most likely diagnosis in TMC's clinical scenario? Is it A. Cerebral toxoplasmosis, or B. Cryptococoma, or C. Primary CNS lymphoma, or D. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or is it E. Tuberculous abscess? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is D. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. I will explain why. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, abbreviated as PML, presents classically with progressive neurological signs worsening over weeks to months, with no constitutional symptoms. Lesions are usually bilateral but asymmetric, with no associated edema and restricted to white matter only, as this is a disease of irreversible demyelination. Please proceed to the next question. 
and the next question reads, PMC, a 35-year-old MSM presents with a four-week history of worsening exertional dyspnea, dry cough and mild fever. On examination PMC's temperature is 37.9 degrees Celsius, his heart rate is 110 beats per minute and his respiratory rate is 28 breaths per minute. PMC's oxygen saturations are 90% on room air. PMC has oral candidiasis and small volume lymphadenopathy in his axillary, cervical and inguinal chains. Auscultation of his chest is unremarkable. Arterial blood gas PO2, that is FiO2 room air is 7.8 kPa. PMC's X-ray of chest is shown in the radiograph in the next slide. Pause the video and carefully scrutinize PMC's X-ray of chest shown in the radiograph in this slide before answering the question in the next slide. PMC is started empirically on intravenous trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole TMPSMX, and methylprednisolone. On the second day of treatment PMC develops a widespread rash consistent with erythema multiform, including oral ulceration and eye involvement. PMC's TMPSMX is identified as the likely cause. So my question to you is, what is the most appropriate treatment choice in PMC's clinical scenario? Is it a. Continue TMPSMX at a reduced dose of 90 mg per kilogram per day. Or b. Start immediate desensitization regimen for TMPSMX. Or c. Switch to Dapsone plus Trimethoprim. Or d. Switch to Ativaquan. Or is it E switch to clindamycin plus primaquine? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is E switch to clindamycin plus primaquine. I will clarify why. This is the correct answer as the patient has presented with features of severe PCP and has developed a severe, that is grade 4, reaction to first-line treatment with TMPSMX. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, WMM, a 28-year-old woman from Zimbabwe presented with a two-week history of increasing confusion, ataxia, headache and fevers. WMM was admitted and a lumbar puncture performed after a CT scan of her head. Investigations are done and the results are as follows. HIV AGAB positive. CD4 5 cells per microliter. HIV viral load 225,000 copies per milliliter. Serum CRAG positive. CSF opening pressure 450 mm of water. The normal range is 120 to 250 mm of water. Protein 0.9 grams per liter. The normal range is 0.15 to 0.45 grams per liter. Glucose 2.3 millimoles per liter. Plasma glucose 7.2. White blood cells count is 0.05 times 10 power 9 per liter with 90% lymphocytes. Cryptococcal antigen positive. CSF cultures show growth on SAB plates consistent with Cryptococcus neoformans. WMM was started on liposomal amphotericin B and 5-flucytosine. So my question to you is, when should WMM be started on antiretrovirals? Should it be A. After two months of antifungals? or b after four weeks of antifungals, or c immediately, or d when a repeat CSF is culture negative, or should it be e when her serum crag becomes negative. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options.
and the correct answer is B after four weeks of antifungals. I will justify why. Cryptococcosis is one of the few opportunistic infections for which early initiation of antiretroviral therapy, that is less than two weeks, is associated with increased mortality. It is generally recommended to delay ART initiation to at least four weeks after start of antifungal therapy to avoid severe immune reconstitution syndrome. Please proceed to the next question. And the next question reads, PZO, a 48-year-old woman presented with a two-month history of productive cough, hemoptysis and night sweats. Sputum samples were processed urgently. Investigations are done and the results are as follows. CD4 count 39 per microliter. HIV viral load 89,475 copies per milliliter. Sputum moderate acid fast bacilli seen. PCR on the direct specimen turns positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. RIF probe is negative. PZO was started on quadruple anti-tuberculous treatment pending culture and sensitivities. After two weeks of treatment PZO was started on antiretrovirals, m tenofovir and efavirins. PZO initially responded well to her treatment regimen, and attended clinic regularly. A repeat viral load at eight weeks was 7,426 copies per milliliter. Her CD4 was 156 per microliter. After 12 weeks of TB treatment, PZO complained that her respiratory symptoms had worsened, and she had also developed painful swelling in her neck. On examination there was a tender hot erythematous fluctuant mass in PZO's neck, as shown in the photograph in the next slide. This was aspirated and sent for microscopy. Moderate acid fast bacilli were seen. Pause the video and carefully scrutinize the photo before answering the next question. So my question to you is, what is the most likely explanation for PZO's clinical scenario? Is it a. Co-infection with Mycobacterium avium complex? Or b. Drug-drug interaction causing subtherapeutic rifampin levels? Or c. Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome? Or d. Poor adherence to TB medications? Or is it E. Resistance to one or more of the TB medications? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is C. Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. I will clarify why. The major risk factors for the development of a paradoxical iris are a low CD4 plus T cell count, disseminated infection and a short time of therapy for the opportunistic infection before ART is commenced. These probably reflect a high pathogen load at the time of commencing ART. TB iris manifesting as lymphadenitis is commonly associated with prominent inflammation. The pus is typically culture negative although it may be smear positive due to the presence of non-viable organisms. While a short interval between starting TB treatment and ART is a risk factor for TB iris, this is not a reason to delay ART initiation in TB patients with low CD4 plus cell counts. ART within two weeks of TB treatment has been shown to reduce mortality in TB patients with a CD4 plus T cell count of below 50 per microliter. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come.
Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 222.